everybody. So, as Kenny already said, the title is Towards Bidirectional Ratchet Key Exchange. And as he also said, this is a collaboration with Bertram Pöttering from Royal Holloway. So, uh, before I go deeper into the details, what our title means and what we did in our work, I will first give you an idea what ratcheting is and what ratcheting is actually good for. So, suppose two parties, Alice and Bob, want to communicate among each other and they, for example, use instant messaging. They usually send their ciphertext over an insecure network, which means that there might be an active adversary who controls this network and who might be able to um, manipulate ciphertext on the network, drop them, and at least read them. And in a setting in which Alice and Bob communicate via instant messaging, their communications uh, usually take a very long time because they set up a session as soon as they want to communicate and they reset up and uh, terminate a session only as soon as one of these two parties uh, buys a new smartphone and this may take a couple of months or even a couple of years. And in such a setting, it uh, might be reasonable to assume that during the long lifetime of such a session, there might be an uh, adversary who, who obtains access to the local states of one of the communicating participants. And uh, one practical example would be that uh, Alice or Bob check in at the airport, and then uh, the police requires them to hand over the smartphone, and then they may uh, have to, or they make a copy of these secrets, and thereby they obtain uh, information on these local states. But in such a setting, we still maybe want uh, guarantees that previous communication before such an exposure of the local state uh, stays secure, and even further, we want that future communication maybe recovers into a secure uh, state again. And there are actually practical protocols that aim to provide security in such a setting, and the most famous uh, example here is the Signal Protocol. And the Signal Protocol also made the term ratcheting uh, mostly famous, so it was around before. And this ratcheting is actually the technique that helps Alice and Bob to kind of uh, be secure in such an adversary uh, setting. So this ratchet is a technique uh, that is um, applied to the state of Alice and Bob that mixes into the state new information such that it cannot be foreseen by an adversary who has the state now, uh, which information will be mixed into the state in the future. And it also invalidates old information such that it cannot be uh, accessed in the future anymore. Now, what Signal simply does is it lets Alice and Bob send uh, Diffie-Hellman shares over the network over and over again, and then both of them use these Diffie-Hellman shares to compute Diffie-Hellman key exchanges, and then these keys update the, the local state of Alice and Bob. What they also do is uh, they use hash chains to update the state forward securely uh, as long as uh, the other party does not respond, so in a in non-interactive setting. But the question that we might ask in such a setting or with respect to this technique, is this technique actually sufficiently secure or uh, what the security of ratcheting actually mean? And this is the question we are looking at in our paper and that we want to answer. So what is the natural security no notion for ratcheting? And by natural, we mean that we provide an adversary full control over the network, let him uh, adaptively over and over again expose the local states of Alice and Bob, and we require full security except from only these cases in which we know that by the be behavior of the adversary, the adversary can trivially break uh, the security. So the adversary doesn't have to break any, um, anything of the, uh, the construction. And we call this the trivial attacks. Now, uh, there has actually been success in providing such a natural security notion for ratcheting before, which was presented by Bellari et al. last year at Crypto. And they looked at a restricted variant of ratcheting in which only Alice is able to send and Bob is only able to receive, but Bob cannot respond in this setting. What they were not looking at was uh, the exposure of uh, Bob. So they uh, allowed in their security notion the adversary only to expose the state of Alice. So in contrast to previous work and also previous practical construction, our uh, models uh, require and our constructions provide full security in an asynchronous communication setting uh, with respect to the exposure of uh, both parties' local states. Now, the, in the remaining talk, I will first give you ideas on how the primitive ratcheted key exchange looks like and that there are actually different variants of ratcheted key exchange uh, that are sensible to look at. 
I will then provide more details on the general adversary model and afterwards look at two of these variants of ratcheting uh, for which I will give ideas on how to model and how to define security. And I will then uh, provide ideas on how we construct a prov provably secure design for these uh, variants of ratcheting. At the end, I will shortly provide a, a summary on our results. So, if we talk about the primitive of ratcheting, we first need to define what the syntax of ratcheted key exchange is. And what I didn't mention so far is, of course, that Alice and Bob need to have some way to initialize their session. And what they could do is they could use an authenticated key exchange to derive shared secrets, but since we want to keep this primitive um, abstract and generic, we just uh, define that there is an initialization algorithm that provides both Alice and Bob with their respective state to start communicating. What Alice and Bob then also need is an algorithm or algorithms for sending and for receiving. And these algorithms take the state, the previous state, and then either output a ciphertext or take a ciphertext from the other party and then update the state respectively for the next invocation of this algorithm. Now what we are looking at in our uh, work is not the security of the, the actual communication, but rather we are looking at keys that are output by these algorithms uh, that then might be used to establish channels or uh, encrypt uh, between Alice and Bob. So we are looking at the consecutive establishment of keys between Alice and Bob and uh, this uh, within one session and this makes uh, ratcheting distinct from authenticated key exchange in which we have multiple parties communicating in multiple sessions and then outputting only one key. Now we can look at the security of keys because we know by the results uh, from last year's crypto by Bellariat Al that there is a composition that says if you have ratcheted key exchange plus authenticated encryption, you derive uh, ratcheted encryption. Now, the problem that we are faced with when looking at this primitive and defining security and then finding provably secure designs for, these, uh, for this notion of bidirectional ratcheting is that it becomes very complicated since Alice and Bob can interactively concurrently send and receive and the adversary can adaptively multiple times expose the state. And therefore we are looking at the single components of the bidirectional ratcheting setting and therefore we are looking at different variants of ratcheting. And the first one that we consider here is the, the unidirectional key establishment. So, in this setting, Alice is only able to initiate the, the computation of keys and thereby sends the ciphertext to Bob, and Bob then on receipt can comprehend and compute these keys, but Bob cannot respond. And we call this the unidirectional ratcheted key exchange, which is very related to what uh, Bellari et al. Uh, did last year, but we will see the differences in a couple of slides. The, the second variant of ratcheting that we consider is the sesquidirectional ratcheting key exchange. And in this setting, Bob is also able to respond and thereby contribute information to the session and thereby Alice is able to receive this information. And these ciphertexts from Bob to Alice do not have the same functionality as the ciphertexts from uh, Alice to Bob have. They only have the, uh, the idea that this adds security and provides stronger security guarantees for the session between Alice and Bob. And we call this the sesqui direction ratchet key exchange because uh, sesqui in Latin means one and a half and we consider these ciphertexts from Bob to Alice to have only half of the functionality. And finally, if we allow both Alice and Bob to establish keys, which makes uh, them being in symmetric roles, we call this the bidirectional ratcheted key exchange. And uh, this bidirectional ratcheted key exchange can actually be generically composed from two instantiations of the sesquidirectional one, which you can see in our extended version. Now, what we uh, have as contributions of our paper and what I'm looking at uh, during this talk are uh, models and security notions for unidirectional ratchet key exchange and sesquidirectional uh, ratchet key exchange plus in our extended version the bidirectional one and we also have provably secure constructions and as I said before the former variant of ratcheting is related to what Bellari et al did last year but what we also allow the adversary in this setting is to expose the state of Bob which then requires stronger security guarantees from the construction. Now, when defining security, we have to define what the adversary is actually capable to do and how he can behave. 
So, uh, as I said before, the adversary uh, controls the network between Alice and Bob, which means that the adversary can control the ciphertext, modify them, and trigger uh, sending and receiving of Alice and Bob. And we are looking at the security of keys, which means that we require the indistinguishability of the real established keys from random elements from the key space. And thereby, the adversary can challenge multiple keys in, this, uh, in the session, and thereby either obtains the real keys or random keys, and at the end has to guess whether it always obtained the real keys or random keys. Now, finally, in order to model what we are actually looking for, which is uh, the exposure of states, is the adversary is now able to adaptively and multiple times expose the local states of Alice and Bob. We are looking in our, um, in our environment at single sessions, and this can be done since we abstracted the initialization away, and thereby we do not have any long-term secrets for Alice and Bob anymore. And therefore, we do not have to look at more than uh, these two parties uh, con communicating in a uh, single session. Oh, sorry. So uh, now to define uh, the security for the unidirectional ratcheting, we look at the primitive that allows Alice to send and Bob to receive, and we exclude these trivial attacks, uh, which we know of that the adversary can trivially uh, win the challenge that is embedded, which is uh, the security of the keys. And the first uh, trivial attack that we need to consider are impersonations of Alice towards Bob. So. If Alice is exposed by the adversary, the adversary can use the state of Alice to invoke the send algorithm itself and then, of course, know which keys Bob, after receiving these uh, own uh, made ciphertext from the adversary, uh, which keys uh, Bob will compute in the future. And therefore, keys uh, that are computed after such an impersonation by Bob will not be challengeable by the adversary anymore. Uh, another sort of trivial attacks that we need to consider since we allow the exposure of Bob are the, the trivial attacks that result from this exposure. And what the adversary can do after exposing Bob is the adversary can take uh, the state of Bob and then invoke the receive algorithm on the ciphertext that are sent by Alice and thereby the adversary can compute the same keys as Alice and Bob will do in the future after such an exposure. But there is one uh, exception for this trivial attack which is that if the adversary previously manipulated a ciphertext from Alice to Bob, then due to this manipulation, the state of Bob uh, might be diverged, and we require actually that the state of Bob is diverged from Alice's one um, to obtain full security, and therefore the state of Bob is not compatible with Alice's anymore. And as a result, an exposure after such a mani mani manipulation uh, does not result in a harm of security of keys established by Alice anymore. There is one final observation that we make in this setting, which is if Alice's state is only exposed, but then the adversary does not use it for impersonating her towards Bob, uh, then this does not harm security of any keys at all. So when constructing this primitive, we need to consider both this trivial attack and the latter observation. Now in the construction, if an exposure of Alice Soleili is okay, then we need some kind of public key cryptography because the state of Alice must not reveal information on keys computed uh, in the future directly. And what we use here um, is simply a key encapsulation mechanism with which Alice encapsulates towards the public key of Bob and then sends the ciphertext and Bob then decapsulates with his secret key. What we need since after an exposure of Bob, only future keys are um, leaked to the adversary. We need that previous keys stay secure, which means that we need an update of Bob's state that is forward secure. What we also need, as I said before, is a mechanism that diverges the states of Alice and Bob after manipulation of a ciphertext from Alice to Bob. And what we simply, or what Bob simply does is, he uses a random oracle on the input of the previous transcript plus uh, the key that was uh, the symmetric key that was recently decapsulated from the chem, and the output of this random oracle is then the actual established key between Alice and Bob, plus a new secret key for the next invocation of the decap decapsulation of the chem. And one can think of this secret key being the random coins that are used for generating a new key, a uh, new chem key pair. Now, in order to comprehend and uh, yeah, obtain the public key that is compatible with uh, Bob's secret key, Alice simply uses the generation algorithm that uses these random coins or the secret key to uh, obtain the public key. 
And this is what our construction for the unidirectional setting actually more or less looks like. So Alice uh, encapsulates, uh, uses the random oracle, and gen generates uh, the public key, and Bob decapsulates and also uses the random oracle to update the state. Now, to define security for the sesquidirectional ratcheting, uh, we again have to adapt the model. So what we need to do is we need to add um, the sending algorithm for Bob and the receiving algorithm for Alice. And uh, we also need to adapt the trivial attacks. And the first uh, trivial attack that we need to add is the impersonation of Bob towards uh, Alice. So, no, of, yeah, of impersonating Bob towards Alice. Since Bob can now be exposed and the adversary can use the state of Bob um, to create an own ciphertext from Bob to Alice. Uh, this simply impersonates him, and uh, this is a rather uh, simple uh, adaption. What is more evolved is that uh, an exposure of Bob can now be recovered. So as soon as Bob sends after such an exposure, Bob is able to contribute new information to the setting, which means that um, after sending, after an exposure, uh, future keys will be uh, required to be secure again. So only the keys that are immediately established after an exposure are again treated to be not challengeable for the adversary. But after receiving new information after such an exposure, uh, KA3 in the lower left corner and uh, the lower right corner, uh, for example, is required to be secure again. And this um, trivial attack then requires from our construction stronger security uh, guarantees for the building blocks for sesquidirectional ratcheting key exchange. Now, uh, when looking at this construction, we see that due to this uh, recovery of Bob's, uh, Bob's state, we need an update of Bob's state that is both forward secure and also helps him to recover from such an exposure. And what Bob simply does is, as soon as he sends, he just simply generates a new chem key pair and sends the respective public key uh, back to Alice, which she will then in the future use to encapsulate uh, towards where the next send invocation. What we still need is the divergence of states between Alice and Bob, but this becomes now very much more complicated because Alice and Bob can send concurrently uh, at the same time. And therefore, as soon as the adversary manipulates a ciphertext, this still needs to result in a divergence of states, but this needs to be handled a bit more complicated. So the, the requirements here, and which I think is interesting for this construction, are that the divergence of states needs to be computed uh, independently, forward securely, and with respect to this asynchronous bidirectional setting. Now what Alice and Bob need to do uh, is they need to update their part of their key pair. So Bob needs to update his secret key with respect to a transcript to a new secret key, and Alice needs to update uh, her public key to, with respect to maybe the same or another transcript to a new public key. And the update of Alice essentially must not leak the secret key that would be updated uh, similarly. And as a result, we cannot use this construction with a random oracle anymore, but what we can use is something that is related to hierarchical identity-based encryption. And the secret key update is then similar to the delegation of a secret key in the HIBE to a new hierarchy, so in which the ID is something like the transcript. And this is more or less what our construction for the sesquidirectional setting looks like. So we have generation of new key pairs as soon as Bob sends, and the update of the part of uh, the key pairs as soon as Alice or Bob uh, receive. Now finally, uh, providing you a summary of the results, the unidirectional ratcheted key exchange requires a CAM plus the random oracle, and also message authentication codes to authenticate the ciphertext from Alice to Bob, which I didn't uh, mention during the talk. What I also didn't say is that in the sesquidirectional setting, uh, the public keys from Bob to Alice need to be signed. Plus, we need this key updatable key encapsulation mechanism, which allows Alice and Bob to update their part of the key pair. And it may sound very inefficient to use something that is related to HIBE to construct this uh, primitive. But actually, the number of updates of a key pair equals the number of ciphertexts that cross on the network. So if Bob sends a public key, and at the same time, Alice uh, sends two ciphertexts, then the public key and the secret key only need to be updated twice. And therefore, the depth of the HIBE is um, yeah, actually not too impractical. 
What I also didn't mention is that Alice and Bob need to encapsulate, uh, no, sorry, Alice needs to encapsulate multiple times if she recently received multiple public keys. But for example, if there is a central server that enforces a ping pong pattern between Alice and Bob, then uh, this can, yeah, this is that not a huge problem anymore. And we will see that uh, there is an alternative for this in the next talk in which we will see a comparable construction, but they use instead key updatable signatures. And finally, as I mentioned before, one can construct the practically relevant bidirectional ratcheted key exchange from two instantiations of the sesqui directional ratcheted key exchange generically plus using one-time signatures. And we highly recommend to do so because understanding the, the bidirectional ratcheted key exchange security notion and uh, what it requires from this primitive is very complicated and therefore we think that the construction, uh, the generic construction, which you will see in our extended version that is linked there, um, is actually sensible. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah.